Hi everyone and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we talk with people from all walks of the publishing industry. So I'm Christy Stratus, historical suspense and historical fantasy author. And my awesome co-hosts here are David M. Kelly, sci-fi author, and Richard H. Stevens, epic fantasy author. And so Lurking for Legends is an interactive broadcast and we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or comment what you hear uh, on what you hear in this show. So tonight is much anticipated. I'm like trying to get through the intro because I'm so excited because we're doing this great live read, as you can tell, since we're all looking really fabulous. Um, tonight's live read is pirates. It's all about pirates. So our special guests are Mac Little and Larry Fain. So we're really excited to have them. And unfortunately, we were supposed to have Anna Applegate. She couldn't make it. Something did come up. Um, so we're still going to read, though, from her work, so you'll still get to hear it. Um, so anyway, before we get into doing our pirate stuff, um, let's have our guests introduce themselves. So, Mac, you've been here before, but tell us a little bit about yourself anyway. Hi, I'm Mac Little. I was uh, born and raised in Conyers, Georgia, but now I'm in Houston for the past 26 years, and uh, I write horror or paranormal and uh, historical romance. And um, tonight I'm going to be reading from The Daughter of Hades. Nice. I'm really looking forward to that too. When we had an interview with you and you were telling us all about your books, I was so interested. So I'm excited to read from it. It's going to be fun. Yeah. How about you, Larry? We're so glad you're here. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm Larry Thain. I, I live in Hong Kong. I've been here for 37 years. I live in a small village on an outlying island uh, near Hong Kong for the last 31 years. <clears throat> and um, for many years, I was a cartoonist in the newspapers here. But in the last few years, I've switched to writing. So I write children's books under a pen name. And last couple of years, my mission has been to write um, books about Chinese pirates based on true stories. And so that's what... Uh, we're going to be reading from tonight an excerpt from my latest book, The Flower Boat Girl. I'm super excited for that one. As soon as I read the blurb, I said, oh, I hope Larry will say yes, because <laughs> <laughs> it, it just sounds amazing. So we've got a lot of good stuff for you tonight. And you're, we're going to actually do um, Anna Applegate's first. Since she's not here, we're going to um, introduce you to her work. We're going to take the privilege of doing that. And uh, Richard's going to tell you all about where we're picking up from with her book. She's a USA Today bestselling author, and she has also been on Lurking for Legends. Yeah, uh, so this uh, excerpt from Anna's book is called, uh, the book called Finding the Rogue. It's book one in the Sky Pirate trilogy. As uh, she says, it's available on Audible uh, US and UK and on Kindle Unlimited as well. And the scene set up for our listeners is Lady Ainsley Lilstrom grew up as the Duke and Duchess's daughter, protected, sheltered, and dreaming of adventure. When her father is killed, her fate unravels, revealing a secret that her father was not the Duke, but a bloody pirate. Oh, wrong eye. I can't see that. <laughs> One of the most notorious, in fact, Silverthorn. To protect herself and her family, she sets out to find him and to try to understand why the Duke's death has triggered medical or magical abilities. Medical abilities. Medical abilities. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I guess uh, maybe I shouldn't have drank a lot. <laughs> he is the captain of the Phantom Saber. He looks out for himself, for his crew, and uses his charm to get what he needs. Then Ainsley sweeps him off his feet by blasting him into a concrete wall. Literally, he agrees to protect her and help her search for her long-lost father. For a price. In this scene, Ainsley and Killian have arrived at the Hall of Records and are working with the attendant there to find information on the last known locations of Silverthorn. Ainsley is hoping that this brings her the information she needs on who she is and why she has lightning magic in her veins. Killian is quickly dreading saying goodbye if they find the answers to where Silverthorn has been hiding out for 21 years. So Mac is gonna, has agreed to be our narrator. Poor Mac, I kept emailing her all day today because uh, so many things kept changing on us when uh, Anna said she couldn't make it. So Mac has uh, graciously agreed to step in as a narrator. We're going to tire Mac out today. And uh, Christy is going to be playing Ainsley Lilstrom. She's age 21, and she's casting as Claire Danes from Stardust. Very well educated, raised as Lady Ainsley, daughter of the Duke, Duchess. At least she thinks she's really the daughter of Wyatt Silverthorne, a notorious pirate. 
And uh, we're going to jump down to David, who's going to be playing Killian Flynn. And Dave is age 26. And I love the hair. Oh, that is he had his 26 year old hair, that for sure. Killian was raised a royal, a royal, a secret revealed later in this book. So we don't know that yet. So while he isn't as uneducated as fellow pirates, he dumbs himself down slightly, but he has a high education and could sneak right back into royalty if he chooses. And I am playing the attendant, Thomas, but I'm really silver thorn in disguise, but you guys don't know that, so oh, I shouldn't have said that. In the 60s, but how come I get the 60s? Is it the hair? <laughs> Pretending to be old and meek, really he is silver thorn, but readers do not know. <clears throat> you can know that he slips up and is gruff, but then also trying to be as frail or older librarian type of person, which is all a disguise. So whenever Mac is ready, we'll start with... Uh, this excerpt from Finding the Road by Anna Applegate. Hmm. Well, I, guess, I guess it's David that starts, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Ensley. I arched a questioning brow, completely caught by surprise with the way her eyes darted around the room. What's wrong? She was acting as though she were trapped or a startled beast who had been backed into a corner. I heard you and your crew, Killian. She snapped at me, but there was fear laced in her voice that made my body recoil. And I will not be kidnapped for whatever reasons you deem appropriate. Not even by you, she said, clearly distraught by what she convinced herself to be true. This crazed woman had no idea the power she had held over me, but hearing the crew fearfully speak of her would certainly give her cause for speculation. Although I had already proven myself to her. And this sort of behavior lay in stark contrast to what I expected. Kidnapped? Are you mad, woman? I stalked toward her, not wishing to startle her further. She took another step back. Before she could run, I wrapped my hands around her arms. Ainsley, stop this. I don't know what you heard. Her icy blue stare bore into mine as she gave me a stern look of disgust. I know you wanted my money. But whatever new deal you've worked up in your head, I refuse to allow you to use me in such a manner. Ansley's eyes appeared to blaze with fire and fury then. I will not be a prisoner to you and your crew because of what I am. I shook my head as she yanked one arm away. Instead of letting her leave, however, I spun her around, pressing her back against the shelf of books, decorum be damned. Cupping her beautiful face with my free hand, I moved the other to her arm and then down to her waist. In an instant, my body pressed fully against her felt frame, and I brought my lips crashing into hers. I told myself to fight it, the need I had for Ansley, but her magic had triggered a reaction I hadn't prepared for. Her spell in the skies had instead been cast upon me. She took me by surprise as she grasped me by my shirt collar pressing her lips right back against mine, demanding and as hard as she could. Drawing away, I sucked in a deep breath. Damn it, woman, will you listen to me for a bloody moment? Our bargain has changed. I rested my forehead against hers in a futile effort to control myself. She huffed. Oh, now you wish to speak to me about our so-called bargain instead of only your crew? Nodding, I captured her lips once more, pulling her body close to my own, feeling the softness of her curves. I growled low in my throat and deepened the kiss even further. I could never get enough of this infuriatingly stunning woman. Her whimpers only continued to drive me mad, and I had to force myself to pull away. The bargain has changed. I repeat it once more, forcefully this time, as she breathed heavily, her hooded gaze stared into my own. I want, no, I need you, Ainsley. I shook my head. Bloody hell, I'm buggering this up, woman. You drive me mad, yet the thought of not having you at my side does something to me right here. I clutched her hand in my own and placed it upon my restless, beating heart. Killian, I, I... Without words, she encircled her arms around my neck, drawing my mouth to hers and sealing it with a bruising kiss. I am a, an uncomfortable sounding cough broke us apart. 
and I turned my head to find the elderly man looking on, appearing very unamused, holding a piece of parchment in his hands. His eyes narrowed at me, seeming to avoid Ainsley altogether. Perhaps this is not an appropriate place for such dalliances, Captain. The attendant sniffed, indicating his obvious distaste. Apologies, but she's... Hello? Hi, Mac. <laughs> no worries, go ahead. Um, I was, uh, I couldn't help but chuckle. Apologies, but she's... I was unable to finish the playful thought before the man thrust the paper toward my hands. Ansley leaned over my shoulder immediately. There are a few more names than simply Silverthorns here, she said. Why? The old man laughed. <laughs> I was given the task of identifying all possibilities of the seal on its location. With only a partial, there's no way of knowing. Perhaps your sender used uh, another seal. I shook my head, reviewing the parchment. Not likely. How will we get everywhere with so many? Ansley paused, glancing toward the attendant who had yet to back away from the conversation. Whatever social skills he had, clearly... <sighs> Realizing we had something to discuss was not one of them. So many people following. She finished abstractly as she could. I knew what she meant, and she had every right to be concerned. Running my hand over my mouth, I scanned the list of places. Nothing was close together, meaning each journey would put us in the skies for longer than I had hoped, unless we traveled by foot on land, but that was dangerous as well. At least in the skies, there were less ships and more opportunities to maneuver away. Ansley's worried expression deepened, and she wrung her hands together. I had no idea and couldn't begin to speculate the thoughts running through her mind. Only minutes ago, she had accused me of kidnapping her. The absurdity. I shall have to be smart about this. Methodically break them down place by place so that I... She was mumbling to herself, and I reached for her hand. I give you my word, Ainsley, I shall aid you as promised. You will not do any of this on your own. Oh, no, you don't. She snatched her hand away. Just because your lips have thrown me into a tizzy does not mean I trust you. How often have you used that tactic, Killian Flynn? The old man snorted next <clears throat> to me, and I glared at him. This man not leave us be? We will find Silverthorn. I vowed again, hoping she would take a breath and pause to remember that I was on her side. I would have thought my lips had done the explaining, but the lady clearly still wasn't convinced. Silverthorn, you say? You won't find him at any of those addresses. The attendant folded his arms across his chest, studying me in particular. He'd taken issue with me. It was beyond evident now. With all due respect, this is a private matter. I responded with a curt nod. I didn't want Ansley revealing any more than she already had about herself, specifically to someone I didn't know, elderly attendant or not. It can be as private as you want. The man's snort was louder than <laughs> his tone had been since we arrived, but his face hardened and his voice grew sinister. It still won't change the facts. Ansley perked up at his words and narrowed her eyes. And what facts would that be, sir? She had more patience than I did. At that very moment, I wanted to ditch the old man and perhaps leave, perhaps even leave, first providing him a lesson on etiquette. Mm. Wyatt Silverthorn is dead. His words came out harsh and cold. The finality of them caused Ainsley's face to pale in an instant. And there's not an address on that sheet that would lead you to him. Not even his grave. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the credits? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
getting hot in this thing. <laughs> Sorry, I will have to grow very disgraceful now. <laughs> <laughs> I've got more of my pirate suit on now. Kind of a old <laughs> sleeveless shirt. There you go. <laughs> and I just got these the other day. I went to a, the local ink parlor mm -hmm. and I got myself some, <clears throat> or can you see it, some tattoos? <laughs> oh, I was wondering why you had post-it notes on your... <laughs> That's hard anyone, work. Anyone who can't read that, it says Hervé Villachez. That is, that is hardcore. <laughs> the plane. <laughs> so that was great, uh, Mac. Thank you for stepping in and uh, reading that for Anna. I'm sure she'll appreciate it. She's looking forward to seeing it later on tonight. But mm -hmm. so that was awesome. That's we fun. appreciate it. Yeah, so love the ending next, line. Next, we're going to yeah, jump into no Larry's. Yes. Yeah, so uh, whenever you want, Larry, you're uh, just jump in and uh, tell us a little bit about the book, and then uh, you can read us the little. Uh, bit of intro you have for us okay this is quite different for a pirate novel we go to the other side of the world to the south china sea at the the beginning of the 19th century um the book is actually uh based on the true story of a woman pirate who was based on the island where i live right now <clears throat> and i did uh, many many years of research about her and turned it into this book. The basic background is that Yang, who's the uh, gonna, is the protagonist and the narrator, was sold into prostitution as a child by her father, <clears throat> and worked on the flower boats. Hence the title of the book. The flower boats were floating brothels in the uh, in the middle of Guangzhou. And after many years, she finally bought her freedom. It was like an indentured servitude. She'd paid off her father's debt, bought her freedom, returned to her home village where just a few months later, she was kidnapped by, by pirates. And the captain, uh, Cheng, Chat, Cheng Yat, um, I'm sorry, was so impressed by her fiery spirit that he demanded that... Uh, she become his wife. And um, after several attempted escapes, she finally, through a certain incident in the book, she resigned herself to being a pirate captain's wife. Now, I have to give some background about this scene because um, about a year later, the pirates were recruited as a mercenary navy to fight in a civil war in Vietnam, which was called Anam at the time. This is all true. And they um, sailed to a border town called Changping, which was this kind of lawless pirate haven. Um, and this is where Yang kind of came alive, that where everything was validated for her. And she made friends with the the kind of the matriarch of this whole pirate group, which was the wife of her husband's older cousin. And um, she's only referred to as Cheng Chut's wife. Uh, she's much older. And so they had just arrived in Changping. Cheng Chut's wife had taken Yang for a tour of the town and, and buying little luxuries like soaps. And then they went to a small... Vietnamese style tea house along the waterfront and that's where this scene takes place it's uh it's a conversation between Yang and Cheng Chut's wife and um and what else was I going to say I get to be the narrator so you're going to have to imagine that this is it's told in first person so you're going to have to imagine that I'm a this a woman doing the narration with a very deep voice. Um, <laughs> just one, one little background because it comes up in the scene is that in one of the shops, the Yang had attempted to buy some Quicksilver, which was a traditional Chinese contraceptive, obviously very dangerous, but they didn't know that at the time. And Ching Chut's wife had stopped her from doing that. So I don't know if I'm already confusing everybody, but... Um, <laughs> 
That's fascinating. Anyway, we'll bring we'll bring you to Madame Lee's tea house in the border town of Changping. Awesome. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> Did you compose that today, Dave? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> All right, take it away, Larry. Okay. The tea house had the cool, secluded, secluded atmosphere of a private pavilion, all polished mahogany walls and furniture under hooded lantern light. A few heads shifted as we stepped inside before returning to their murmured conversations. This felt like where the rich of Changping would meet and make deals. I supposed that being wives of mercenary naval leaders earned us a seat among the elite. We were greeted by a white-haired woman dressed in a flowing pink dai, the same billowing garment worn by the girls in the street, only hers shimmered with lofty elegance. Our table sat beside an opaque paper window. Passing figures outside moved like shadow puppets. Madam Lee, my cousin Cheng Yatsu. Ching Chat's wife said, then switched to Annamese. One of the few words I made out was the one for tea. Madame Lee showed teeth as black as the soap merchants, then bowed and shuffled away. Welcome to the center of the world, for our kind, that is. Ching Chat's wife said. You don't seem happy about it. Oh, younger sister, forgive me. I'm spoiling your fun. No, I'm just, well happy to be here. Strange, you know, how much I feel at home. A nest of runaways, smugglers, and thieves. Not sure I'd call it home, though. A man at another table nodded to her in a familiar way. He looked like he'd stepped off an opera stage with a top knot of thick white hair and a padded blue gown that men only wore in old paintings. Chet's wife returned the greeting. You know him? I said. A local broker. Buys from us sometimes. Looks like an actor. Or a clown. Not so loud. She leaned in and lowered her voice. He's a Ming Hung. Confusing, I know. End of the last dynasty. Ming loyalists bolted to Anam to save their necks. A lot in this town. He's probably fourth generation, but they act like the Ming will come back. And then they'll return to China. See? I told you, this place attracts freaks like maggots to rotten meat. I resisted the urge to stare. Was there nothing ordinary in Changping? Even the tea was unusual. Madam Li delivered two lidded bowls in which longan fruits, embedded with lotus seeds, bathed in pale, fragrant tea. She placed a dish of melon seeds between us. I can't drink this. It's too pretty. I said... Chat's wife sipped hers. Drink it. Where we're going, beauty is in short supply. While my tongue reveled in the tangy sweetness, I asked myself, why go anywhere else? This town had whispered to me before, even before I'd arrived. Its voice had gotten louder the moment I stepped onto the quay. But now it sang out in intense flavors and fragrances and colors, from what little I'd seen so far, Chang Ping reminded me of parts of Guangzhou. It was certainly no filthier, <clears throat> yet it possessed something completely different than anything else in the world. A nest of runaways, smugglers, and thieves, she'd called it. Wasn't that me? Wasn't that us? The center of the world for our kind. Its odd stew of people and languages and costumes, even its fake jade and rotten pears, were all new in a way I'd never experienced. A new concept of newness. Throughout my life, newness had always been something to fear. New boats, new masters, ugly new customers with sickening new needs. But here, newness held a promise. History didn't matter. Here, you could invent your own, like the Ming Hung over there, absorbed in some imagined past. Like the long hairs who'd stopped being Chinese. Here I could cast away my clothes, my hair, my entire past, and construct a whole new person, an admiral's wife, a woman of standing, as long as Cheng Yat intended to stay. I hope we're not leaving too soon, 
I said. Whenever that dog prick Chen Tin Bao shows up, then south to where the real savages live. I savored my tea while hers sat until it went cold. Her eyes darted around the room, every direction except at me. Something bothered her, and it wasn't Chen Tin Bao. Finally, she replaced the lid on her cup and, folding her hands on the table, stunned me with a piercing look. What were you thinking about in there? Quicksilver? A half-chewed lotus seed stuck to my tongue. Her tone of voice told me her view of the matter. She needn't say any more, but she did. Married three months already, she said. I gave her the tiniest shrug. It's too soon, don't you think? Too soon for what? He's 36 and no son. Why do you think a man his age takes a wife? If he wanted free sex, he didn't need a ceremony. I spit the seed in, onto the upturned tea lid. I thought we were sisters. Now you're my mother-in-law? She feigned amusement, spinning her tea bowl cover between her fingers. If a wife doesn't conceive, there's no telling what a man will do. Some of us are worried. Oh, really? Some of who? You realize I've spent every day of my life keeping babies out of this belly. I'm not sure I could get pregnant, even if I wanted to. I cracked the melon seed between my teeth, as loud as I could for emphasis. And I don't want to. Nonsense. Chat's wife replaced the cover and pushed her tea away, spilling a little over the edge. She covered her mouth with her hand, but I could see how her lip trembled. I wish you could meet my boys. Twelve and thirteen, real men now, working on other ships. Too big to run to mother anymore. She dabbed her eyes. I understand why you think like you do. Maybe I would too if I'd lived your life. But it's time you accepted that that life is over. You're a married woman now. Every woman wants children, whether they know it or not. Of course I knew. No such desire lurked inside me, not in the deepest, darkest recesses of my being. What was childhood except hard work and fear and a spot of innocence that scraped and pummeled and smacked away all too soon. What were children other than an ever-present burden and worry? Maybe it was true that many women desired children, but what difference did that make to me? I didn't doubt that my mother wanted me, but how would that made her life better? What had she accomplished by having a son when all he'd done is die in childbirth and take her with him? Where was the happiness? Mine had ended before it even began. I wished childhood on no one. I'm sorry, I said. Maybe I'm not a, nat a normal woman. Maybe that's why I feel like I belong in this place. Nothing is normal here. Why have a child just so a man can toss them into other men's ships or pawn them off to pay a gambling debt or live with a horrible mother like me who would resent them to my grave? The kindest thing I could do for a child is never let it be born. A cloud seemed to engulf her face and carry her to another world. She sat quietly until life returned to her eyes. She nodded faintly like she'd made up her mind to confess. I had a younger sister, inseparable. We played everywhere. I think we never stopped laughing and teasing. One day in her eighth year, she woke up covered in spots and hot as cinders. Then she was gone, like that. My joy died with her for so many years. It was born again when I cradled my first son in my arms. She stirred the melon seeds with a trembling finger. No, the kindest thing you can do is make another person's life worth living. I didn't know how to respond. Of all the strange new notions that had struck me today, the strangest of all was the idea that one person can make another happy. Chut's wife reached across the table with that cloudy look back in her eyes. You were born in the goat year. Dear, my sister departed. I look at you and think she's returned to me. Younger sister. I took the extended fingers, needed the chill out of her flesh, but I had no words to offer her. Was she seeing me 
or her sister's ghost. I wish you'll join us when we go home. She home? Said. Home? What do you mean? Tai Yu Shan, like I told you. He promised me again. When this is all finished, this business in NM, we'll build a house there as grand as any stinking merchants. Our sons will be traitors, not pirates. But don't you feel that this place is home? You said it yourself. We fit in here. I'll tell you something, younger sister. She opened her bowl and signaled for fresh boiled water. You're new here. It's lively, I admit. And they do make nice tea. But Changping is the ugliest town in the world. A place fit only for the scum of land and sea. Is that all you want to be? It's all I've ever been. Our men, too. They have a good reason to stay. Ching Chat's wife sighed. <sighs> to fight, sure. Ah Chat likes the action. Talks, talks, talks about the thrill of victory. But let me tell you. She cracked a seed between her teeth, sucked the kernel from the shell, dropped the husk, and licked her finger. Let me tell you, to live a life like ours? She sighed. And then to retire rich, have a home in one place, surrounded by family, and to end up alive? Alive! She leaned forward until our noses nearly touched and whispered deep in her throat. That's true victory. That was great. Really enjoyed it. We had two yes, great that was excellent. Oh. Fantastic. Really enjoyed that. A whole area of history I've never looked into, actually. It was great. Yeah, it's it's an area that's not very well known. The research was a challenge. <laughs> I would imagine. Mm -hmm. That's great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. One of you ever said that's awesome. Now, where are we here? I've got the wrong sheet up on my screen. There we go. And if you are all looking for these books, I am posting them in the comments. So all three of them are down there. Oh, that's um, awesome. Max is about to be down there. <laughs> the rest are <laughs> already down there. So where can we find that book, Larry, if we're looking for it? Okay, it's called The Flower Boat Girl. It's on most uh, retailers, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all the rest. And you can get your free first chapter with historical notes from my website, which is piratequeenbook.com. Awesome. Uh, Christy's put them in the, the chat there, so that's awesome, too. So... Wonderful. Thanks for that, Larry. Thanks for joining us all the way from Hong Kong. That's really cool that we the internet's actually pretty decent for us. So mm -hmm. looks like Dave's yeah. going through a wardrobe change over there. I can't wait till the powder <laughs> pushes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to put my glasses back on now because I'm going to have to read something. <laughs> <laughs> so this next story is called The Daughter of Hades, and it's by Mac Willow. And uh, Mac, you've been busy tonight, uh, but we'll let you take this one away. Okay, so The Daughter of Hades is a historical fiction uh, love story. It follows Denny and Jimmy, they're twins uh, on Barbados, enslaved. They, es they escaped slavery on a pirate ship called the Hades, captained by Captain Duff, who has a relationship with their father. And, um, and he's sort of adopted uh, Denny and Jimmy, who's called Red here. Uh, as as his own children, and he'll do anything to keep them safe. Um, a slave catcher, privateer, Captain Smith, is new to the waters. He captures Denny to return to uh, her owner, but he learns of a great Spanish prize that he'd rather take. And knowing Duff is one of the best buccaneers in the Indies, he rather um, control him by holding Denny hostage to get control of that Spanish treasure. And so um, here uh, we have uh, Captain Smith and Captain Duff having a parlay where, Duff, where Smith sets his terms. Um, 
Captain Duff is a Scottish pirate of the Hades. Uh, he had sworn his life to aid in whatever manner he can the Abosi family and penance for his work on the slave ship. And he must choose between his sworn oath between um, coming to his aid of his truest friend or saving um, the Abosi's children. Uh, Captain Smith is a privateer with an eye on hunting the Spanish galleon. He schemes to bring the most successful pirate under his control through his usual methods of blackmail and extortion. And a couple of minor characters is Pax. He's a French Huguenot. And um, he escaped to the Caribbean to uh, escape religious persecution. He's on the crew of the ship called La Fortuna. And Mabaye is a bosun on La Fortuna. So, Mac, I just uh, want to clarify, what kind of character is Captain Smith? Uh, Captain Smith is an evil uh, goblin, <laughs> as hmm. they like to call him. And he's, he likes to bring people under his influence. He's, um, he, he practiced slavery in a different sort of way. I love all the historical things we have going on. I wasn't cast as the goblin. <laughs> Are you trying to be typecast, David? Last well, time you complained. <laughs> an interesting note, Larry, is that the love interest in this book is a Chinese pirate. Um, and he, really? what, yes, he is set in 1649. And he escaped mm. after the Ming Dynasty collapse in uh, 44. So uh, he's in exile in the Caribbean. Very cool. Kind of a transition yeah. for us. Right. Yeah. But we want to see him tonight. Is that based on a real historical figure? Uh, well, loosely, there, I mean, there is some legend that uh, when Chen Zhu uh, committed suicide, his sons were um, rushed away from the palace by his <laughs> officials, and uh, they escaped to anonymity. And uh, they lived in hiding because uh, the Qing dynasty were hunting them to kill every last descendant of the old dynasty. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. So, yeah. Very yeah so that really, relates to the guy in my story who was the, dressed in the old style outfit. Ah, anyway. cool. Anyway, also, so I, uh, I'm so interested. Yeah. I, I, hope, I hope to connect with you later on this. But anyway, I'll get started. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Duff felt himself mired in a fugue where nothing in this world made sense. He had received a correspondence from Smith. The goblin wrote that he and he held Denny in a safe location. If Duff did not want her turned over to her owners, where she must surely be horribly punished, he would parlay with Smith. Dread formed a knot in Duff's gut as he read the summons. The dark feeling remained with him now, heavy and burning hot with fury, as he rode the broken waves toward the shore of Tortuga. Duff caught the mad look of determination in Red's eyes. The captain wished he could find something to say to allay the boy's unease. But what could he say? And if he knew the words, could he say them convincingly? The other men in his boat looked grim as well. Wilkes, Long, Atabisi. Even Carrie had a somber, resolute look upon his face. It was as if the wee dauber considered, considered himself a loyal member of the crew, despite his affiliation with Smith and the flogging Wilkes gave him. Carrie followed Red around like a wee duckling and printed on his maw. Red seemed to have some sympathy for the lottie as well. Carrie had provided intelligence on Smith's ties in Barbados, which could produce leads in finding Denny. The wee man might prove useful still going forward. The other rat, Milton, rode on the long boat with Pat Semabaye and about 20 other souls from La Fortuna. Milton was a good navigator and he and Pat's, and he held Pat's contract now. Fort didn't want to lose either of them. So he assigned trusted crew members to stay at Milton's side at all times to ensure he sent no correspondences or otherwise contacted Smith or his agents. Ahoy! Duff called to La Fortuna's crew as they rowed alongside their boat. Where's your captain? Pats replied. 
Ian Ivan, stay behind. I say no more. Duff said, remembering Ford had special plans for Yvonne. Duff and the combined crews of La Fortuna and the Hades trudge through the muddy streets where ruffians and whores rutted against the buildings in full sight of the rest of the cutthroats and rogues. Raucous laughter came from the faithful bride. Raucous laughter coming from the faithful bride offered the promise of mugs of rum and friendly whores. The sight of the tavern should have lifted Duff's spirits, but he knew what awaited him on the other side. Wilt slapped Duff's back and squeezed his shoulder, offering what encouragement he could. Mabaye left a group at the entrance. I'm going to take a week. I'll join you directly. He handed Milton off to Wilts with a surreptitious nod so the quartermaster could take over monitoring the traitorous navigator. Inside the tavern, the atmosphere thickened. The gloom, heavy with the odor of unwashed bodies and whiskey, pulsed with the shifting flames of tallow candles. Men found a long table and took their seats around it. Duff left them and walked toward the borough where Smith sat. He had seen the goblin conduct his business and plan his hunts with the crew of the Black Serpent from here before. Duff noted two sentinels stood in the corners, flanking Smith. Shadows covered them like shrouds. Only the glinting of their black eyes showed as firelight danced a grisly jig in them. Upon arriving, Duff spun the empty rush weave chair so that its back abutted the table and he straddled the seat. Welcome, my friend, said the little goblin. A gleam of candlelight slithered in his bug eyes. I'm not your friend, Duff said. Are you sure? Smith slid a folded document across the table. What is this? Why, it's happy news. See for yourself. Smith said with glee. Duff unfolded the paper and a lock of hair fell out. He looked down at the coiled strands of nut brown hair tied with a bit of twine. He read the letter. Property secured and held in the agreed upon location. Alkins. Duff tossed the paper back at Smith. The dead air in the place didn't carry the letter far. Smith reached to retrieve it with a grunt. This was nothing Duff didn't already know. That's all right, Smith said. You might keep your token from Hades' daughter. As a reminder that you and I are bound, if that is, you care to see her alive and untouched. The smug wee bastard. What do you want from me? Whatever happened to our dear navigator, Postelite? Said Smith. Duff didn't trust himself to speak. Speak. He took a moment to swallow the bile and invective rising in his throat, and allow only a disgusted sigh to escape. I ain't got a navigator. He said. I beg your pardon. Said Smith. He's dead for all I know. Terrible shame, that is. He was such an entertaining chap, that one. Told such interesting stories. My favorite one was of a beautiful Ashanti woman what lived in a cottage overlooking a rocky shore on Tortuga. Smith's gaze held Duff. The knowing behind those bulging green orbs, the awareness and the self-satisfied tilt of his lips said everything the captain of the serpent did not. The bastard knows. After that night at the Quran, Duff had feared it. He could only hope Fittler's ass got to her in time. Well, I won't waste any more of your time, Smith said. I'll get straight to the reason I asked you here. It was not to tell me you had me by the ball bag. Aye, there is that. And there's also the matter of the Santa Madre. She's a Spanish girl in what set sail for Portobello, Panama, a few days ago. I intend to take her on her return trip in six months' time. She's set to sail to Hispaniola with a belly full of gold and silver. The prize will make ye and I 
very wealthy man. So you want me to help you take a ship in six months' time? <laughs> Duff said. If I agree to this, will you let Danny go now? And lose my leverage? I do not think you understand the nature of our contract. Ah, uh, but it's a contract between us, is it? Aye, it is. Now, if you would like to exchange um, something of equal or greater value. Am I to sit around and wait for you to tell me it's time to take the ship? Absolutely not. How long have you idled for so long? An idle mind is a devil's playground, eh? Well, we shall go hunting to keep you from any mischievous endeavors to find Geraldine. Will Fard be working with us? Duff said. For a moment, he envied for, for having no encumbrances, which would make him vulnerable to such a dauberous, this, wretched, this wretch sitting across from him. Still, he held out hope that this development would not mean he would have to sever his por partnership with his good friend, his true friend. They knew each other's rhythms and could bring them into sync, working as a single creature. Together, Duff and Fort became a leviathan with many tentacles, working in concert through a single mind. I'm glad you brought that up. Smith replied. I shall be blowing his ship to smithereens anon. Duff stood up, toppling his chair. What do you mean? Why, I thought I said it plainly enough. There is time yet for you to run and warn him, as I see you are wont to do. But consider this. If you stay, I will consider us in a binding contract. Ye will get the mulatta girl and protect you. Her family. Duff's blood ran cold. Every instinct screamed at him to run, to get forward, yet he couldn't move. He had to think. I don't have time to think. He's lying. It was just too evil. Was Smith laying a trap for him? God damn it. Duff turned and looked at Red and Pax, who sat deep in conversation. Mabai hadn't joined them. Can you guarantee me the safety of... Duff couldn't bring himself to name Red. He held the foolish hope that Smith had no confirmation that Red Bones was the other slave he sought. Can you guarantee me the safety of the others involved in helping Dinny escape? Duff said. Depends whether you take a seat at the table with me or not. And... When it's done, when Ford is dead, ye will not speak of our dealings to Pax. I intend to bring him and Milton into my fold. Ye will do nothing to prevent this. Why? The goblin's eyes flashed with malice at being questioned. He tapped the table with his short fingers as, as if to compose himself. Finally, Smith said, Sit. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Margaret is together. loving your goblin face, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> loving. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah. Wild. I don't know if Margaret see my uh, my new tattoos. They're, they're very, very intense. My Herbe Villages. <laughs> I think I'm dating myself when I put that on there. <laughs> I wrote that word in there, or those names in there, and I'm thinking, I don't know if anyone's going to recognize who that guy is. Thanks for that one, Mac. That was good fun. <laughs> that was. That was, great. that was very good. Yes, thank you, Mac. And, yeah. and Mac, where can we find uh, this book and uh, other stuff? Uh, you can find it on Amazon and at my publisher's website, Inklings uh, Publishings. Great. Margaret doesn't get the reference. Can you share who that is? I don't know if Margaret's put me on or not, but uh, Herve Villages is a tattoo. On from, uh, Fantasy Island. The original Fantasy Island with uh, Ricardo oh. Hall and oh, so that right. from, like the 70s and that. So a <laughs> little, little uh, he said, be plain, be plain. He was always a <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I, 
so we must be the same age then. <laughs> I, grew, I grew up in the called, 70s. It's called that. tattoo, yeah. So mm -hmm. those are my tattoos, yeah. But anyway, that's dating myself. <laughs> Probably a bit before your time, Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> Rub it in. <laughs> so thank you both for being here. And uh, thank you, Anna, for. Uh, giving us your excerpts. Uh, Anna, unfortunately, couldn't be here tonight. Uh, life got in her way and uh, she had the bailout today, but uh, she's looking forward to watching the live reads and uh, having a lot of fun listening to us um, screw up her story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. well, what's, we'll start with Larry. Uh, where, what's coming next for you, Larry? I'm working on the follow up book to The Flower Boat Girl. This, the first book tells the story of her rise to become the most powerful pirate in the world, which was real. And these, the book I'm working on now is charts the rest of her career, which is just as interesting and exciting um, until she, uh, until she retired as a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure so. who said that one, but, uh, <laughs> and when can we expect that Larry? Oh my gosh. I don't know. I'm <clears throat> sometime oh. next year. These Mama things take a long morning. time for me to write. The research um, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. the research is done, but the writing, I'm not the fastest writer. And I just try to be very careful about it because it's its kind of a mission for me. And, uh, and it's never going to make me rich, but it's just, it's something I feel compelled to do. So I'm mm -hmm. working hard on it right now. Awesome. That's great. And how about you, Mac? Uh, what's next for Mac Little? Um, I have a novella coming out in the spring. Uh, one of the characters in Daughter of Hades fascinated me so much that I just felt like I need to dedicate a whole story to him. It's Badu. He is a privileged slave on Barbados, and uh, he foments a revolution in order to uh, help rescue his daughter. So um, the novella chronicles his time in pre-colonial Africa and his in parallel with his escape from Barbados. Awesome. Wow, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And um, let's see, currently I'm working on the second full novel to uh, Daughter of Hades. And if I can just get these dang sea battles down, I'll be done with it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got a title for that yet, Mac? I'm sorry? Have you got a title for it yet? Um, a uh, shelter in a hostile world is what we're looking at right now, hmm. unless they change it. Yeah. And, cool. um, yeah. And I do, I, I, I hate to go on, but I, I am, I do have an idea about writing about the, the Asian population in Mexico, um, in the, in the 17th century. So Very I think, cool. I think that's going to be my third novel. Mm -hmm. awesome, I love historical fiction. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. Again, thank you both for being here. And Christy, uh, what's new with you this week? Uh, well, the first three episodes of Corrupted Magic are out. They are on Kindle Bella, mm. and they are also thank you. They are also free on Patreon right now. And um, also the first two are free right now on my website and the third will be posted soon. There's a delay because it's free. So um, I don't know how many episodes is going to be. I'm currently writing episode 10. Um, and, you know, for those of you who don't know, yay, historical fiction friend. Yes, <laughs> this is three people here, are historical fiction people. <laughs> Pretty cool. So, um, yeah, this is the Corrupted Magic is the follow up to Grimoire Society of Dark Acts. And it picks up right where the first book uh, left off. So I've been really, really enjoying sticking with those characters. Um, I, I really like them. So I don't know, I may stick with them for quite a while. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's about, I think that's about it that's new with me. What about you, David? Well, Christy, do you know if uh, what's coming up for Anna at all? What's next for her? Let me think. Um, she's going to be, ha she recently released a, uh, sports romance book under a pen name, and I can tell you that because she says on the pen name that she's author Anna Applegate. So I'm not ruining anything. I promise. <laughs> but sports uh, romance. If you're interested in sports romance, her pen name is Ava Woods. Um, so she has one of those out. She's going to be releasing more of them, and I think the next book in her 
um, fairy, um, like uh, fantasy books. I'm sorry, I can't remember the, uh, the name of the series right now, will be coming out in the next few months. So those are two things I know she's working on. Cool. Well, for me, I've hit 80,000 words on uh, the third Logan's World novel. And kind of like getting close to wrapping everything up. Uh, so that's like uh, really good. That's going to be great. And then I'll toss it to one side and work on something else for a while afterwards yeah, yeah. <laughs> before I start editing it. Um, other than that, just kind of like all sorts of craziness going on in my world at the moment. So it's slowing things down a little bit. Oh. But uh, it happens. But uh, this has been fun. Yeah. Awesome. Definitely. Richard? Richard? Yeah. The Get minion bird. I guess. <laughs> we love <laughs> in our household. We, and actually, uh, we were going away soon. And uh, it's nice to have someone who's still old enough to actually go watch a Minions movie with me. So <laughs> I don't, you know, I hate to go and stand in line with all these <laughs> years old. And then I'm standing up by myself. I just, uh, so anyway, <laughs> Hopefully, we'll be seeing the rise of Gru next week. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the editing for Wind Walker is still going on. It's such a, uh, I don't mind editing, but it just takes so long. It's 672 pages, and it just, oh my God, it's taken so long to get through. So, yeah, I was hoping the editing would be done before this week was out and have it all formatted and sent off to the printer so I could have it ready for Fan Expo in Toronto next week uh, or in two weeks, and that's not going to happen. So, uh, Wind Walker will be releasing in September, and I can't wait to get print copies. It's my biggest book yet, and being an epic fantasy writer, it's finally time I've got an actual tome, so I look forward to that. And cool. Dave and I, uh, Dave and I actually just did a, a book signing event uh, last weekend. Uh, mm. It was a cold water steampunk festival, and it was about two and a half hours away for each of us, and we met right in the middle, so it was kind of neat. It was awesome seeing all these people out in their really funky costumes. It's amazing the work that they put into these things. Mm. I keep thinking yeah. that they buy these from somewhere and they say, no, they make them. And I'm just totally wowed by uh, all the creativity that goes into just making these costumes. I couldn't imagine. And there were even a couple of uh, people that were like 10 feet tall. They were walking around on stilts. It was quite a, quite a day. Oh so. my gosh. It was yeah. very hot, but it was a lot of fun. And, uh, and my favorite dinosaur was there again. Yes. The Velociraptor, <laughs> but he didn't, <laughs> he didn't bite David's head this time. So it's good. No, he, he, he stood away from my head, which is probably a safe thing to do. <laughs> We tried to chase him down, but it was 40 degrees out, and I was in the night's costume, and I just said, the heck with it, and I went back. <laughs> yeah, it was incredibly warm. It was very warm. So anyway, that's what's new with me. And uh, so thank you again, uh, Larry and Mac, for joining us, and especially Mac mm -hmm. today. I kept uh, hitting poor Mac up with yeah. emails uh, when Anna <laughs> realized that she couldn't make it, and uh, Mac was so gracious to step in and fill a few it, roles for us. So. It was so much fun. I hope I did it justice. It was Oh, this was great. a great time. Yeah, he did great. Yeah, this is fun. I really enjoyed it. It's a great concept doing these kind of readings. Ah, <laughs> thank you. It was fantastic to read from your work. Yeah, yeah. it certainly, and it certainly, I think, I, Christy and Dave agree, this is their most enjoyable episode of the month. As much as we love talking to authors, we have so much fun doing this because then, you know, I can put on a goblin mask and. <laughs> <laughs> You put on a mask, Richard? <laughs> yeah, I, I have a mask on now. I, I, have, I took it off before. <laughs> so, again, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And next month's live read genre, we're still kind of debating what it's going to be. Uh, we thought about mystery. We had mystery in March. Uh, we're thinking about doing a children's, uh, children's genre next month just to mix it up, uh, totally mix it up. I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around how we're going to uh, play roles in a children's book. So I'll have to lend my mind to that a little bit. Uh, so probably mm -hmm. September's uh, live read will, or will be with uh, children's authors. And uh, maybe if it doesn't work uh, with Dave and uh, Christy stepping in and me voicing some of the characters, we'll just have the children's authors read their books because I, I know they do take great joy in doing that and we'll have a lot of fun listening to them. So uh, next week's guest will be fantasy and science fiction novelist Zachary Hagen. Zachary is a Colorado native who has lived all over the country teaching, writing, and editing. He's an avid reader and an up-and-coming author in the fantasy space. And I, I think he must have put that in on purpose, so there's fantasy and science fiction, <laughs> with stories to tell about people and places you want to know. So once again, before we leave, thanks again to Mac Little, Larry Fain, and Apple Anagate, uh, who submitted her excerpt. 
Uh, thank you for sharing your stories with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So until we meet again, everybody, take good care. All right. Back yeah. at you. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, <laughs> I did end my guess. <laughs>